Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the June version of uh, Berlin Machine Learning Meetup. Today we have two amazing talks as usual, but what makes today special is the fact that today we have almost all the present and past organizers of the meetup. Daniel is missing today, but it's fine. I think he will join at some point. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the YouTube chat and we will moderate and the speakers will answer some of the questions at the end of the talk. So I'm really looking forward to today's meetup and uh, now I will hand over to Trent. So over to you, Trent. Uh, hi everyone and welcome to, I guess, I, I think our third now virtual session. So, um, and we are once again spread um, throughout the world and you know, not just Berlin. Um, and we have two speakers um, and uh, the, the second speaker is Andy Mueller and the first is Philip Blair. So, I will um, take the honor to introduce Philip now. Uh, so Philip is a senior research engineer at Basis Technology based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, USA. Uh yeah, uh I'm I'm fixing it, please wait. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. But the, the stream's okay? The video's fine. Okay. So Hello? Yes, it's working now. Is it audible now? Sounds like we're good. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Uh, do we want to start over from the beginning, or should I just go right into it? We didn't. We didn't hear. We didn't. Yeah. Just start off with it. Thanks. All right, so um, we're going to just start over with the audio introduction, and then I'll, um, this is Trent, and I will pass uh, to to Philip. Um, so uh, Philip, uh, he's a senior research engineer at Basis Technology, which is based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, USA. He spent the last four years applying cutting-edge NLP research to a large variety of industry needs, and he's published work on predicting downstream performance of word embeddings based on, on their intrinsic properties. And so he's officially based in Cambridge, um, and he'll probably tell you more about where he is these days and stuff. And uh, he's going to be talking about doing hard things with less data. So uh, without further ado, please take it from here, Philip. Thanks. Great, thank you. Okay, let me share my screen. Great, okay. So uh, yes, as Trent said, my name is Philip Blair. And today we're gonna to be talking about doing hard things with less data. And so that's gonna be with a combination of something called active learning, which we'll discuss, and just some basic outside of the box thinking. So um, briefly, just a little about myself. Uh, uh, as Trent said, I've been at BASIS for four years. Um, I typically am based in Boston, although recently um, due to current events, I'm uh, stuck in Paris. And um, 
my, my responsibilities as a basis typically revolve around the machine learning infrastructure that we use under the hood. Um, so just to motivate this talk uh, and what we'll be exploring, uh, a little bit about what BASIS does. So our, our flagship software for dealing with unstructured data is known as Rosette, which is a text analytics suite that provides various uh, text analytics capabilities in a variety of different languages. Uh, and so this is used by customers in wildly different domains, ranging from uh, legal applications to banking and finance uh, to governments. Um, but you know, a problem when we're working in a domain like NLP software is that these domains often don't have very much overlap with one another. You know, you can imagine that uh, it's doing something like detecting entities uh, that are mentioned inside of a financial news document is a completely different problem from analyzing tweets. So what we typically find is that there's really no one size fits all solution for these problems for customers. So in an ideal world, we would be able to take our pre-trained off the shelf models that have been tuned for some generic version of the problem and combine them with customer specific data uh, in order to produce a model that's best suited for their needs. Now, the problem with this is that this step now, of producing customer is data is a lot of work. I mean, you need to collect a large amount of data, then you need to decide how you're gonna annotate it, then annotate it, uh, and then train your model with it. And all of those steps translate to cost. So really, the, this data need is uh, our, our fundamental limitation when it comes to domain adaptation. And so, you know, uh, a question that we can ask ourselves is, you know, ML algorithms require a lot of data, but like, what if they didn't? What if we could somehow reduce the amount of data that's needed? So as a case study for this, uh, we're gonna explore the problem of event extraction, uh, which I'll explain in a moment. And what I like to show this diagram of just kind of a hierarchy of complexity for NLP problems. So at the bottom of the pyramid, we have very basic tasks like tokenization and morphological analysis. So that's gonna be a problem where you take a document uh, you break up, break it up into different words that are mentioned. Uh, break it up into you might say words, this word's a noun, this word's a verb, so on and so on. Then, as kind of a a question of how these words in the document that you found interact with one another, you can then do things like named entity recognition, where you're now saying, okay, you know, here are the words in the document, but what are the entities that are mentioned? Like who, uh, you know, th these tokens for uh, say, say Berlin, maybe is a location, or European Union would be two tokens that you say, this is a single organization, and so on. Then, as we move up the pyramid, we can start asking questions about how to build up pieces of information combining entities. So you might have uh, relationships, such as, you know, like Volkswagen acquired such and such company, or, um, you know, such and such world leader had a phone call with another one and things like that. Uh, and so you can see this dotted line on the right here, which kind of illustrates the, the frontier of uh, commercial NLP software, where things beneath that are generally not as complex. And so we can rely on machines to do them uh, with much higher fidelity. Whereas things that are above this line typically require some amount of human intervention. Uh, and so of course, you know, uh, on our research and development team, we're, we're always trying to find ways to, uh, to push up this line. So more concretely, like what is event extraction? Uh, and the problem is pretty straightforward. R what we're gonna be doing is taking documents such as this one, uh, Kevin called Lisa last Tuesday. And then we're gonna run it through our event extractor and we're going to get an output like this, where there is a single call event, which is kind of an abstract notion, uh, which really just means that this document mentions that a phone call took place. Uh, and then at the concrete level, we're going to associate different roles with that event. For example, Kevin's the caller, Lisa's the callee, last Tuesday is when the event took place, 
And uh, called is our key phrase or our trigger phrase is what it's sometimes called. And uh, we'll explore that a bit later. Now, you know, from that example alone, you might think that, okay, well, we can pretty much do pattern recognition for a lot of that, right? Ex which is uh, true for some cases, but definitely not in the general case. I mean, take, for example, this first sentence, uh, the prime minister called the general election. You really need to have some amount of world knowledge to understand that in this case, the, the usage of the word called doesn't actually mean a phone call. It's more of a different sense of the word, and we don't want to extract that as an event. Similarly, if you're doing pattern recognition, uh, this second example might trip it up because next Thursday uh, looks like it would be a time for the call event, but it's not. And Susan is, is kind of ambiguous whether Susan is actually the callee in this instance, and we probably would not want to extract that. So in practice, um, we typically break apart this problem into these two sub pieces. Uh, first, we ask whether there is an event present in a document. And if so, where is that event? Then once we've done that, we can ask, what are the roles associated with that event in the document? So once we've simplified the problem like that into these two pieces, we can certainly throw a traditional statistical supervised machine learning algorithm at the problem. Uh, but the problem with this is that these methods are relatively data hungry. And a more practical concern for the, the problem faced by our team is that when we talk to potential customers about event extraction, they usually are interested in completely different kinds of events. So you can imagine how these two pieces can combine into a really nasty problem of suddenly, for every person who's interested in uh, using event extraction, we now need to go through this expensive data annotation and curation process. Um, and that just makes the entire thing too cost prohibitive to deploy. So what we're gonna try to do is attack this problem on two fronts. On the one hand, we're gonna try to just reduce the amount of data that we need for event extraction. Uh, at the same time, what we wanna do is think about annotation as a living process and annotate only the amount of data that we absolutely have to in order to get a model that's as good as if we annotated you know, an arbitrarily large amount of data. Uh, and so we're going to uh, first explore this idea of reducing the amount of data that the model needs. So uh, here's a different pyramid to look at. Um, it's the shape of the day, I guess. And um, you can see that you know, at the top of the pyramid, we can have an algorithm for doing uh, you know, reasoning, which doesn't require any specific training data, right? I mean, that would be a rule-based system like you would find from like the 70s when they were doing AI. Um, and you know, that wasn't fit on anything. That was just someone sat down and just wrote out, this is how, say for example, events look. And we're gonna end up with this algorithm uh, that's just completely deterministic for handling events. Uh, of course, the trade-off with that is while you may not require training data, you do require someone who is a linguistics expert and is an expert in the specific domain of events that you're interested in, um, which of course is a big ask a lot of the time. Um, and, would cert and it would certainly be a bottleneck if you were trying to uh, use that kind of system for all events that you're interested in. Uh, another note about this is that it's a relatively high precision, low recall sort of uh, algorithm because especially in natural language, you know, text is messy. And so you're not gonna be able to write a totally exhaustive set of rules that you can use to catch all possible instances of an event. Now, as we move down the pyramid, uh, we can get into linear classifiers, which are relatively simple models that uh, you know, the, the work that's involved in training them is really just spending the time doing what's known as feature engineering, a term many of you are probably familiar with, where really the, uh, the elbow grease is not as much in the data collection as much as it is just making sure that the classifier gets the correct view of the world, so to speak. Now, um, 
Uh, of course, then moving down to more sophisticated techniques that we have in literature today, uh, we have deep neural networks, which part of the big selling point there is that you don't have to do this feature engineering step. Instead, you pretty much just give it enough knobs to turn that it can figure out on its own how best to look at the world. Um, but the trade-off that you see is that as that work diminishes, the amount of data that you need increases. So really what we're looking for is the sweet spot toward the top of where we can kind of mimic a rule-based system uh, without having to write rules um, or go through the amount of data, the data requirements of a linear classifier. So for our, our event extraction model, our solutions are, uh, uh, was based on what's known as instance-based learning. Uh, and so the basic idea here is imagine we're doing just a simple binary classification problem where uh, we're trying to classify you know, points in space as orange or purple. So we have our annotated training data. In this case, it's two points. And we get an input at runtime. And we then ask the question, what color should that point be? So all we do is we look at the, all of the training data points, and we find the closest one. And we say, OK, well, the closest point is orange. So we're just going to copy the label that we pick for that point. So you know, the, the immediate benefit of this is that it's what's known as model free, which basically means that there's no actual parameters that we're fitting, uh, but instead is just fully based on um, the, uh, the topology of your training data. And additionally, if you add like a threshold for like a minimum similarity, then you could totally do classification with as little as one training data point. Now, on the downside, you can see how this would scale extremely poorly, right? It, once you've annotated a large amount of data, unless you're working in some specialized domains, then you have to iterate over all of your training data set every time you're running a query. Um, and that clearly doesn't scale as you uh, build up your training data set. Uh, additionally, this suffers from uh, another poor recall issue of, um, you know, you can imagine if you had a data point that was not really similar to any of the training data points, then, you know, the question of which point is most similar might not really be that meaningful of a question. Uh, however, uh, the good news is that this is a really good solution for bootstrapping a system very quickly. Now, circling back to event extraction, we now have another issue of we actually need to define some notion of distance, right? Because we're not looking at points in space, but we're looking at text. Uh, and so how can we do that? Now, one idea would maybe be something like edit distance, right? Um, where you simply just look at the the literal similarity of two strings of text. However, um, the problem with this is you can easily imagine how just like changing a name in a document, like, you know, from, uh, you know, John called Susan to Philip called Susan, you know, just the, depending on your choice of change in that name would have a dramatic impact on the edit distance. And so it becomes very confusing how to actually correlate that with like a semantic similarity. So, it, but at the same time, it's kind of the right idea, right? Like, you know, we want to have this notion of picking points that are kind of similar somehow to uh, training data points that we've seen in the past. Uh, and so a question we can ask is how to simplify this idea. So we can look at these examples um, that I absolutely made up in order to convince you that I'm right, uh, which basically show the same similar structure for call events, right? The, <clears throat> uh, the rough idea here is, you know, you, if you squint a bit and you look at all three of these sentences, they all kind of have the same blueprint of, you know, whether it's John had called Susan or Bill will call Nancy or whatever, it's some person call or called or whatever, some other person. And you know, while I just said I did make these up, um, we have seen in practice that this is often true for many events that um, people who have come to us are interested in. So, um, you know, a question is how can we actually distill this concept into something that is um, 
uh, quantifiable, right? Into like, a, like an actual computable distance measurement. Uh, and the answer is that it is possible. So, you know, we can imagine an input like you know, John had called Susan last Tuesday, right? So at the beginning, this is just a blob of text, right? Then we can run it through something like uh, a named entity recognition tool, such as ours or an open source one or whichever, and extract entities. Um, so then once we have these entities, we can then kind of semantically break up this text into spans of text that are entities and spans of text that are something else. Um, now, as mentioned toward the beginning, uh, we typically associate something known as a key phrase with events. And so what these are, are typically high precision clues of an event being present inside of a sentence. Uh, now, as demonstrated before, these are not 100% precise uh, with the, the, the prime minister calling a general election. However, there is a, usually a very strong correlation between these key phrases and the underlying event types. Now, again, our goal here is to really only focus on the details that actually matter for doing this, uh, uh, this instance-based selection, right? So what we're gonna actually do now is, now that we've broken apart the text like this, we're just gonna throw away all of those details of the actual text. Uh, now we just have this basic pattern or a rough shape that we're trying to find. Um, and so now, all we have to do is compare it with our input uh, in order to get our distance. However, there's a question of how we can actually compare a sequence of chunks, right? Now, the first step is knowing how to compare two chunks together. Uh, and we, we developed this, uh, this table for how we do this. And um, you can see that you know, for entities, we base it on whether they're the same type. And that's just a zero one match of like, you know, a person matches a person, uh, but a person does not match a location, just very basic. Um, because key phrases are rather special, we just completely disallow them for matching entities. And when we're doing key phrase matching, we compare what's known as the lemmas. And all this means is that we're basically just using the dictionary form of the word. So, you know, call and calls would be the same or call and called would be the same and so on. Now for free text, um, it becomes more complicated because we, we really want to compare the, the semantic information in those spans of text. So again, something like edit distance isn't really appropriate. Uh, so we use some, uh, everyone's favorite uh, text vectors, which you know whether it's word to vec or BERT or whatever, the, the basic idea is the same, where you're going to end up with some sort of fixed size vector representing the semantics of that text. And if you take the cosine similarity between those between two such vectors, that should roughly correspond to the semantic similarity of those two pieces of text. Um, and so what's really cool about this uh, is what you from what you can see here, there's nothing that we've feature engineered that's specific to any language. So what that means is we can take the same off the shelf algorithm and use it for English, use it for Japanese, use it for Chinese, whatever, um, which uh, you know, is always a really neat property to have. Uh, and in fact, uh, just qu qualitatively, we've seen that in non-English models, uh, this algorithm appears to perform just as well. So you know, we can compare two chunks, but now we wanna compare a sequence of chunks. And the way that we do that is with an algorithm from DNA processing known as the heaviest common subsequence. So uh, I couldn't find a great picture of this that wasn't totally filled with Greek. Um, so we're gonna settle for one Greek letter. And um, the basic idea is that it's very similar to an algorithm that uh, many of you may have seen um, in, well, say like a, an algorithms class uh, known as the longest common subsequence where basically you have two sequences of inputs, maybe they're DNA pair, base pairs, or they're um, uh, chunks in the document in our case. And you're basically just looking for the subsequence of those two sequences that uh, best matches up. Um, and the, 
the difference between longest common subsequence and heaviest common subsequence is that we associate a weight with each pair of chunks, um, where that weight is defined on the previous slide. Um, yeah, so we can actually we can put this all together and just take a quick look at what this will look like in practice. So we're going to take our input here, which is um, a uh, you know a much longer input, and we're going to run it through our chunking algorithm. And uh, this is going to then give us our detail-free, ten uh, you know, uh, thousand meter overview of what's going on in this document. Then from there, we can take our what, the example that we've been looking at before and treat it as effectively a search problem, where we're going to find, based on this query, the, the subsequence of our input that best matches it. And then based on our heaviest common subsequence calculation, we can then assign a score to that match. So you know, once we've done that for um, all of the, the training data points of interest, um, we can then just sort by that similarity, remove any overlaps, and maybe introduce like a threshold for like a minimum matching score. And voila, we have a, a means of detecting the um, uh, which events are present in a document just based on our training data and no parametric model at all. Now, that addresses how to detect the presence of an event, but we still need to somehow fill in the roles that are associated with that event. And the good news is that we can still do this with our instance-based technique. Uh, and the basic idea here is once we have this alignment between our input and our query, we can then look at the roles that are defined in the query and just kind of trace along those aligned chunks and copy them into our input. So for example, uh, the, the entity chunk containing Lisa corresponds to the entity chunk containing John. So that's where we copy the caller label to. Um, same thing with key phrases and the callee. Now, uh, the, the time instance is actually a little more interesting because um, you know, we actually don't have any uh, discrete output from our, our NLP stack that tells us you know, next Friday is a phrase or something like that, or last Tuesday is a phrase. So we have to get a little more creative to make sure that we only are highlighting the correct part of this last text chunk. Uh, and the way that we do that is again with text embeddings, uh, text vectors, excuse me. Um, and the, the, basically the, the rough idea there is you're finding the sub portion of that text chunk, which has the highest semantic similarity to in this case, next Friday. And thankfully that happens to be last Tuesday. So taking a step back, um, thinking about uh, how we would deploy this for um, a real use case, something that we would like to explore would be improving the recall of this model uh, with hybrid technique. So um, you know, the idea there being that once we've annotated some more and more data, we can then more and more rely upon a traditional statistically based model. Uh, and then eventually once we have enough, we can fully rely on that and put on the shelf our poorly scaling uh, instance-based technique. Now, going back to the beginning, we were going to take two steps uh, to, to solve our problem. Now, the first was reducing the, the requirements data-wise of the model, but then we also need to reduce the amount of work that we're actually doing. So th the key point to understand with this is you know, a lot of times as machine learning practitioners, we kind of think that, okay, we have this pile of data, right? Like it's either it's all unannotated or it's all annotated, but we're gonna use that and feed it into our algorithm. However, it's really not like that for, um, uh, it, you know, in the real world, right? We have, we start with a pile of unannotated data and we take that and we convert it into a pile of annotated data. And that is a living process, right? You know, we start, we 
you know, you have your pile of data, you pick off pieces of it, hand it to an army of annotators, who then put it in a new pile of annotated data, which is then used to train your algorithm. Now, in a lot of real world applications, an important thing to note here is that there's usually some like definition of success in all of this, meaning that once your model has achieved a certain performance, you can kind of just stop annotating more data. Um, and so because this process uh, translates to expense, our goal is to try to uh, minimize the amount of time it goes on. So if we look at these three steps, um, you know, two of them are kind of irreducible, right? I mean, you can't really make the annotators annotate faster. Um, and then the training time of the model, I mean, you could make an argument that that could be an impact. However, like on the time scales we're discussing here, it's really not the bottleneck. Um, however, what we can look at is how are we picking which sample we're going to annotate next from our raw data set that hasn't been annotated yet. And so to understand what the idea is here, you can imagine like we're doing an annotation for just named entities, right? Now remember the goal here is we want an algorithm that we can feed to the document and it can just discover which named entities um, are present, like which people, locations, and organizations are present in that document. So now imagine we've annotated this first document at the top and we now have an annotator coming to us and saying, I'm ready for more work. Give me something else to annotate. So we have a decision to make, right? We can, uh, we can give it the second document. However, it's already seen Berlin as being annotated uh, as a location. So it probably would be more useful for the model to learn about this other location, Paris. Um, especially because, you know, it probably could correctly predict the middle document already, given uh, that we've already shown it that Berlin is a location. So the basic idea here is that at every time point in time when someone comes to us asking for more annotation work uh, we are going to give them the document that is you know most informative uh, for the annotation process uh, and so the idea of making this kind of systematic is known as active learning so what we do, it, what we need though, is a way to, instead of just looking at the entire data set and manually picking up a document, is having some sort of algorithmic approach to determining which document we should be handing to the annotator next. Uh, and the good news is that this is actually not too difficult to do. So all we have to do is redirect that first arrow in our previously unidirectional workflow uh, from instead of going directly to the annotator, we then send all the raw data to the model that's been trained so far and have it predict on it. Now, uh, that model will happily do so and will ideally assign some sort of confidence to each of those predictions. Now, intuitively, the prediction that is least confident about should be the one that will be most informative for that model going forward. So imagining back to the, the previous slide, uh, the, the, comp the prediction on the document mentioning Berlin will probably be, uh, will probably have a much higher confidence than the prediction on the document containing Paris. Um, and right, so you know, now that we have the model in the loop of this annotation process, uh, we can empirically see that there is a benefit to, uh, to the selection. Uh, so here's here's a couple experiments that we ran. Um, so on the left, we have uh, performance on what's known as the, the Connell 2003 data set, which is just kind of a basic standard uh, named entity recognition data set that's usually used for benchmarking in academia. Uh, and you can see that this dotted line at the top represents, you know, what if we what if we trained a model on everything that's been annotated? So then the orange line represents, okay, what if we just were randomly picking samples to annotate next? How is the performance going to improve over time? Uh, or for the blue line, we use this active learning approach to do our sample selection. 
And you can see that the gap between the blue line and the dotted line closes much more quickly than our orange line example. Um, additionally, you can see on the right for our internal named entity recognition data set, uh, we see a less dramatic gap, but it's still a gap nonetheless of us being able to achieve that asymptotic performance much more quickly uh, than if we had annotated everything. I mean, on the right, you're seeing a roughly you know, two thirds to three fourths reduction in the amount of data to get a ballpark similar model. Um, yeah, so taking a step back to uh, event extraction, uh, we can look at how this instance-based technique looks in practice. Um, so we developed this annotation studio, which serves two purposes. For one, it will provide our event extraction capabilities but it also uses active learning to do our sample selection. So uh, what was previously shown is that we annotated that exact same sentence that was there before. And we're gonna see how just based on uh, that one sentence, our, our query, or sorry, our, our input from the previous slide is able to be correctly detected just with that single data point alone. Um, and I, I don't believe this slide made it in, but we, we do have a threshold, so we can also um, avoid some amount of false positives um, uh, with just the single data point. Now, you know, the natural question here is what can we take away from all this? Um, or can, what can you take away from all this? So, first of all, active learning can be very helpful for reducing data requirements in a scenario in which you don't already have all of your data annotated for your supervised model. Um, you know, active learning we showed uh, we showed being used for um, uh, we discussed being used for an instance-based technique, but you definitely can use it for really any sort of supervised learning approach. Um, However, non-supervised techniques do allow us to bootstrap models quickly. And really more broadly, the, the, I think one of the big takeaways here is instead of reaching for a tool that's sitting on the shelf that we're used to reaching for, for these problems, we can sometimes achieve really great results by just thinking outside the box and doing something that's a little unorthodox uh, for the, the problem that's been presented to us. Uh, and that's all I have today. So um, I guess I can take any questions, um, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Philip, for your very nice talk. Uh, um, yeah, there are a few questions. Um, when you introduced uh, instant-based learning, uh, the question is, what was, uh, was that uh, uh, the k-nearest neighbors uh, algorithm that you were referring to uh, in that context? Right, so it's definitely very closely related. Um, I mean, k nearest neighbors based, uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's roughly the same. Um, the um, uh, basically, we're looking at the one nearest neighbor uh, answer I see. for this. I see. Um, another question Do you combine event key phrases and text matching into one single score? That wasn't quite event? clear from, from, Sorry, uh, I... from your slide. <clears throat> so the question, the question is, if you combine event, uh, key phrases, and text matching into one single score. Ah, uh, yes. So the the table that I showed shows how we compare like a given pair of chunks, but certainly we then take those and um, uh, we when we when we run them through our heaviest common subsequence algorithm we do kind of fold all of those together into a single normalized score. Uh, and I apologize, I don't have the, the formula that we use for that on hand, um, but yes, we, it's, it's a normalized score of all of the individual chunk matches. I see. Um, I would like to uh, go back to the very beginning of your uh, talk. You, you kind of skipped over uh, uh, tokenization. Um, my question is, um, do you do, uh, apart from word tokenization, of course, uh, also do uh, sentence tokenization and, and how do you do it? <clears throat> right. So we our, our software does support doing tokenization um, for just tokens, but we also can break on sentences and things like that. 
Um, the way that that's actually implemented, uh, I, I must apologize, I don't work on that part of the stack, so I don't have a great answer, but I believe it's a combination of a rule-based approach um, and you know, some statistical techniques. I see, yeah. Because um, I know one of our, <clears throat> uh, one of our big things that we're proud of is our really good Unicode support. So, and because, you know, when text comes from all sorts of different languages, you never really know what it's going to look like. And, you know, mm -hmm. of course, different languages break sentences differently. Um, but we, we try to have uh, as, as full coverage as we can get. I see. Um, while you build your models, uh, what exactly do you optimize? Um, uh, is it precision uh, or is it recall? That is to say, are you more interested in, in avoiding false negatives or more interested in uh, avoiding false positives? Well, ideally, so, we want to avoid both. However, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah the um, that's a good question. So, for for our purposes, we typically were trying to um, uh, we first would focus on precision because you know in theory this this model should be fairly precise, right? Because it's it's essentially doing a um, uh, you know a match, right? And the way that these events that we were testing with are structured is they're, they're fairly regular. So a lower precision model would be kind of suspicious. But then once we had optimized for precision, we then took a step back and said, okay, how can we try to boost the recall of this model a little bit? And I apologize that I don't have um, any uh, really useful numbers to present on how this works. That's why I included the, the gift toward the end, just to kind of illustrate that you know, uh, this isn't just um, make believe. Like it does do stuff, um, but uh, yes, we we don't have any like numbers on like a, a good public benchmark or something like that at the moment. There's a question um, about the possibility of applying this approach to of active learning uh, to uh, image classification. Mm -hmm. Is is there? Did did you understand my uh, my question? Yeah, uh, certainly. So what's really nice about active learning is that it's something that you can really apply to uh, pretty much any supervised classification problem or supervised machine learning problem. Um, you know, the idea is that like, you know, for image classification, you could imagine like if you've got a CNN, a convolutional neural network that's outputting some sort of softmax score, um, then, you know, when looking at the highest probability match, if it's pretty low, then that probably means that it's a lower confidence prediction, right? Now, there's an asterisk on this. I think there are more robust ways of measuring confidence um, from uh, neural networks, but uh, I don't want to get into that at the moment. Um, but yes, I mean, it's kind of a, uh, active learning is really a black box defined thing, right? whether you're doing image classification um, or doing um, text classification or anything really that's supervised, you certainly can apply it. Uh, it's just about finding a way to hook it into that sample selection process. So picking your next unlabeled image, for example. Um, how do you deal with words that, uh, oops. How do you deal with words that uh, can have more than one uh, one meaning? Um, you talked a little bit about uh, uh, the verb "call" right. in the beginning, but uh, how do you how do you how do you deal with that uh, in general? Right. So, in general, um, for for things like "call," uh, we typically would um, rely on other context from the labeled event to help disambiguate whether it's like a real instance of the event. Now, if we're discussing in terms of text vectors, uh, at the moment, uh, we, we are really just using a, a context-free representation for the words uh, just based on word to vec. However, certainly, um, if you've heard of these newer models such as like BERT or ELMO, um, they can be used in order to kind of enrich those vectors with the contextual information and kind of help provide you a, a vector that's more of a um, you know, instead of just being for the word call, it's mm. for the word call in the sense that it appears here. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your uh, talk and for the uh, uh, the answers you gave. Uh, and with that, I'll give back to Mike to, uh, to you, Trent.
All right, hi everyone again. Uh, yes, Philip, thank you very much once again for the talk. And uh, with that, I will move on to our second uh, and final speaker of the night, Andy. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce Andy. He's probably very familiar to many of you uh, because he um, was um, the original organizer of this group along with Daniel. So um, in terms of uh, bio, well, yeah, I'll just read it. And, and Andy was one of the founders of this meetup and he is one of the core developers of Scikit-Learn. And uh, it says we'll write more about himself later, but maybe he can just, uh, Andy, I'll, I will leave it to you because you've had, uh, you know, quite a few different interesting things you've done in your career. So maybe I'll let you just start off that with your talk. Uh, so without further ado, uh, please go ahead um, with, with your talk about auto ML. Thank you. All right. Thank you for the introduction. Give me um, one second to share my slides. Okay. Huh. That's interesting. All right, so now it should be working. Um, yeah, so thanks for the introduction, uh, Trent. So I'm uh, really happy to be here uh, with all the organizers. I think it's so great that people have uh, kept this going. So I mean, I have to say my initial uh, engagement with this meetup was pretty minimal. It was mostly Daniel doing all the work, uh, but I'm, I'm glad to, you guys are keeping it up. So yeah, I'll be talking about accessible machine learning in Python, which is about my uh, new sort of side project uh, called Dabble. So I don't, I don't think I have a slide introducing myself, but so um, right now I'm at the Columbia Data Science Institute where I've been for about four years. Before that, I was at NYU and um, Amazon. And so a lot of my uh, work has focused on making machine learning accessible, in particular working on scikit-learn. And so, um, in this talk, I want to talk uh, a little bit more big picture about like machine learning workflow and how I think about uh, making the machine learning workflow even easier and more accessible, in particular in the uh, PyData uh, ecosystem. So when you start with any machine learning um, project, uh, one of the most important parts uh, is defining the problem and defining um, how you're going to uh, measure success for your problem. Um, but uh, once you've done that, there's um, really so many steps to be, uh, becoming a full product. So you start with data collection, uh, data cleaning, exploratory data analysis and visualization, uh, then building the actual machine learning model, uh, tuning the model, doing parameter searches, um, then you do some model evaluation, looking at some uh, different metrics, uh, confusion matrix, rock curve, anything like that. And then finally, you do integration into your system and deployment, uh, maybe live testing, A-B testing, and see how does the deployment of your model impact your system. Um, however, this is not really a linear process. After each of these steps, you usually um, go back to the previous steps and fix some of the issues that you found. So um, in a practical setting, very rarely do you collect the data and then just use the data that you collected in the beginning. Very often you go back and change things in the data collection process, uh, at least if you can. Um, and at any of these steps, you might find out, well, I should have actually collected data in this different way, or you uh, figure out, oh, well, I should have cleaned in this way or that way. And so um, this is not only really a circle, this is more like a fully connected graph where uh, at each step, you might go back to previous steps and improve what you did there before. And I think um, most machine learning practitioners are really well aware of this like feedback cycle and this iterating on the model and iterating on all aspects of the model. Um, however, I think there's not a lot of software tooling that can help you with this. 
So I hope you can see my mouse. But so um, if you look at what scikit-learn does, which is like a very popular library for doing machine learning, it's all about model building and uh, some model evaluation. And so a lot of people really pay a lot of attention to really uh, tweaking the model um, and tuning it and finding the very best hyperparameter, doing auto ML and so on and really um, disregard the other aspects, and in particular, how this feeds back to the other aspects. And I think um, one of the reasons for this, as I said, is that there's really good tooling for model building, but there's very little tooling for the whole life cycle. Um, in particular, um, I'm focusing on a more like exploratory setting. There are some tools for doing data collection and uh, continuous deployment of models in a production setting um, that are very automated. Whereas I'm thinking more about the human in the loop process where you as a data scientist are trying to um, explore and trying to build a new model. So a couple of these steps I think are currently actually quite painful in the uh, PyData ecosystem. So I think people do, um, much too little exploratory data analysis. And I think one of the reasons is that it's quite hard. So I'm trying to do a very basic plot here showing the continuous variables for a standard benchmark data set, the adult data set, um, which is like adult census. And so this is a very simple, very clean data set that I read in a CSV. And let's say there's two classes um, depending on income. And I would just want to uh, compare what are the distributions of five continuous variables for these two classes. It's like a super obvious question. But uh, trying to do this, the nicest way I came up with is uh, this year using Seaborn Facet Grid. And uh, to be honest, I definitely will not, would not remember how to do this because it's quite tricky. If you want to do the same thing with pandas straight up, it's probably even going to be a couple more lines of code that are um, about as hard to understand. So doing any basic exploratory data analysis um, in Python is, I think, actually quite tricky because very few of the tools are geared towards machine learning. And uh, then if you look at the doing the actual machine learning, so this is on the same data set, which is, as I said, a pretty pretty clean, simple data set, how you can build a minimal model with scikit-learn. So scikit-learn is very explicit and um, allows you to specify it in a lot of detail what your model should look like. But if you just want to say, oh, I want to run logistic regression, this is the minimum code you have to do in scikit-learn basically to properly run logistic regression on um, a simple CSV file. So you have to scale your data, you have to impute uh, continuous variables, you have to 100 encode categorical variables. So this is even like the most simple thing you can think of. You have to concatenate these, and then you make a pipeline with logistic regression, and then you tune the hyperparameter. And so this is like, I mean, for me, this is relatively easy to write down because I wrote a bunch of these tools. But I think this is like, this is way too long for what should be the hello world of machine learning. And so, um, this makes people spend a lot of time on this part, which should really be like a, a small part of the whole process. You should uh, spend at least as much time on doing visualization and data cleaning and thinking about your data collection as you think about building this. This here should really be the, the Hello World version. Um, and I think this is way too hard. On the other hand, there's um, a bunch of work in automatic machine learning, which makes this simpler. And so uh, actually one of my favorite packages there is uh, auto sklearn. It's done by a group in Freiburg, um, picked up by um, uh, uh, Matthias Feuerer, who does some really excellent work there. Um, so they basically completely automate the search of models. Um, and here's an example from their website. So I, I really, love their work, I want to say that. But I think this uh, solves not the problem that I want to solve. So here, this uses the digits data set, which is like a tiny data set that's a toy data set that comes with scikit-learn, a 10-class classification data set. And so in terms of interface, they've done this great thing. They built this auto sklearn classifier. It basically searches over all models in scikit-learn. And um, you can call fit and then predict, and that's it. It does everything for you. But this will run for about one hour on 
really what is a toy data set. The model is actually quite good, but I think if even on a toy data set you run for an hour, you're really taking away the interactive aspect of the whole procedure. You're taking, uh, you're really changing the nature of how this works because you and if you have to wait for an hour, you're definitely gonna like go grab a coffee or like start some other tasks. You're not in this loop of improving your model building process of understanding your data uh, and so on. So uh, there's a clear break in sort of this interactive loop ex of exploration if you have to wait for an hour for anything to happen. And so this, this might be uh, a good thing to do very late in your process. So if you, are pretty uh, happy with all the things that you've done and you think, okay, now I want to get like this last percentage point or the last fraction of a percentage point out of this model and this data set, then um, I think doing something like auto SQL learn, which searches a huge parameter space in like a very fine grained way is a great thing to do. But if you're just uh, starting on the uh, model building, and you're very much in this interaction loop of trying to see how should I clean the data, how should I collect the data, um, what do I need to visualize, then I think uh, waiting for an hour is not great. So what I try to do is come up with um, some tools for this uh, machine learning um, sort of life cycle or um, iterative uh, human in a loop work process. And so I want to say, A, this is all like very alpha stage software. So there's still a lot of work to be done. It's more a little bit like a proof of concept, but I hope it's going to be useful. And the other thing that I want to say is this is meant mostly for uh, initial development of solutions. So to get you to a prototype fast, because I think that's actually what's one of the most important things in machine learning data science is get fast to a prototype and then iterate. Iterate all these different aspects of the problem so you get better understanding of the task. All right, so what I did is um, trying to um, write little software pieces to do most of these tasks for you. Um, I want to give a little bit more background on how I did this. So a lot of this is more software engineering, but there are some parts that are actually machine learning research. And so uh, the, the research that we did uh, relied a lot on benchmarks that were most, nearly all of them were run on the OpenML platform. And so as you might not be available, um, might not be familiar with um, OpenML, I want to give you a very brief uh, introduction to it. So OpenML is this online platform that was created by uh, Joaquin van Joren and Jan van Rien, um, both from the Netherlands, as you might be able to tell by my mispronunciation of their names. And it's a collection of um, machine learning data sets associated um, with tasks. So these are not just like CSV files, so that's, but you can think of them as like they're uh, CSV files, but they also tell you which is the target column um, and what is the task. Is this a classification task, a regression task? How many classes are there? How imbalanced is it? And then together with these data sets, um, there's basically records of um, machine learning algorithms run on this data set together with all the hyperparameters. And you can see that there's um, 10, 10 million runs on this data set on these data sets. So, um, and this is from people using, um, so this started with, with Java and Weka, and then uh, R and Python support was added. I was um, mostly involved with the, the Python support. Um, and um, so you have this huge array of data sets together with people running machine learning algorithms on them. And, um, this is really a great database to, to uh, learn from what models work on what tasks. And so here's an example of one of the data sets. So there's a couple of subsets um, that are used, um, that were basically curated for doing benchmarks, particularly the OpenML CC18 is, is I think uh, about 80 relatively balanced um, classification data sets. Um, uh, that we used for benchmarking. 
And you can see well, uh, different kind of uh, algorithms that were used on this. And then there's a leaderboard of all the machine learning pipelines and their hyperparameters and so on. To so here, uh, the models are run by people on their local machines, and then the results are uploaded to OpenML. So OpenML is basically just a big database, and it hosts the data sets, but the algorithms are run locally. And yeah, so I worked with um, Matthias Freyer and, and Jan and uh, many other people on this uh, Python interface, which allows you to integrate uh, quite closely with scikit-learn. So here is um, something from our paper that we submitted to JML ROSS on how to train evaluate a simple decision tree classifier on each of the uh, classification tasks from the OpenML CC18 benchmark. So this is basically running a benchmark. So you, here we're uh, downloading this benchmark suit, uh, OpenML CC18. We build a scikit-learn classifier. So here we just have an imputer and the decision tree. And then um, for each task in this benchmark suit, we download the task for OpenML. Then we run the model on the task. And this will give us some um, the benchmark results for this task. The task also includes the uh, splitting procedure, so whether there's like a training and validation set or to do tenfold cross-validation, what the splits are in tenfold cross-validation, and so on, so that all the runs are comparable. And then in the end, we can upload the runs to the server. So you can see there's actually very minimal code to run on a large variety of data sets, then record the result in the central repository. And so we use this repository um, to um, learn what we called uh, multiple defaults, which is basically a prior priority list of different um, de good parameter values to try, hyperparameter values to try. Um, this was, I think, done by uh, me and Jan and uh, some other people uh, somewhat in parallel to um, the Freiburg group with Matthias and Frank doing this. Um, so they published this in the Practical Automatic Machine Learning, which is uh, documenting their uh, posh auto SKL learn system. Um, well, we did this uh, at first in this paper for just um, basically single algorithms and their configurations. And so the idea is to create a list of values that are good to try. So this is, an, in a sense, a very simple way of meta learning um, where you try to give recommendations not based on a particular data set. So you say, well, um, overall, these five settings of these algorithms are five that are like diverse and good. And if I try these five settings, then I'm probably going to get a good result. So um, let me talk a little bit more about uh, the math behind this. So what we're trying to do is find a portfolio of configurations. So let's say we have a budget of five. And we, let's say we want to run XGBoost. And so we say, oh, we're allowed to uh, run five different hyperparameter settings of XGBoost. And we want to maximize the score um, on average across all data sets in our benchmarks. So let's say we have our 80 or 100 data sets. And we want to find, a subs um, find five hyperparameter settings. So if we take the maximum over these five, we get the best score. That sort of was right, written down here. And so the idea is that then if you have a new data set, you just have to run these k, uh, k, in this case, five different configurations, and you'll get a good outcome. Optimizing this is actually um, like exactly as an NP-hard problem. It's relatively easy to see, even if you have a a uh, fixed list of um, configurations. This is related to um, a set cover problem. Um, but you can, uh, but it's also relatively easy to see that this is a submodular um, maximization problem. Okay, let me uh, walk you through um, an example. So let's say we have four data sets and four configurations. Um, we can actually um, get an approximation um, by running a greedy algorithm. So as I said, solving is exactly as NP-hard, but you can get, um, because it's a submodal optimization problem, you can get a constant factor approximation 
uh, by using a greedy approximation, uh, which means uh, we can start with a set of zero configurations, and then uh, we add one configuration at a time um, that will improve the overall pool of configurations. So I, I call these the portfolio, which are the, the K configurations that we selected. So at the beginning, I have no configurations. I look at the configuration that's best on average. It would be here configuration one. And so uh, I would create a set of one configuration with, which is just configuration one. To get the second configuration, I don't um, get the second best configuration, which be, would be configuration two here, but I get the configuration that is basically most, uh, that will increase the score if I do the ma compute the maximum over these two. So if I add to the configuration one, configuration two, then, um, well, for data set one, the score won't increase. Um, for data set two, the score will increase um, from 0.1 to 0.5. On data set three, the score won't increase. On data set four, the score will increase from 0.4 to 0.6. If I look at configuration three, if I add that to configuration one, it will in not increase on data set one. It will increase hugely on data set two. It will not increase on data set three and will not increase on data set four. But overall, you have a much larger increase here than you would have if you add configuration two to the portfolio. And so you iterate this and um, build a portfolio of a size K. The nice thing is that um, because you built this iteratively, now if you build a portfolio of size K, you automatically build a portfolio for any size that's smaller than K. So we can build a portfolio of size 50, and if the user says, oh, I'm just going to, I want to use a portfolio of size five, we can just use the five first entries of our portfolio of size 50, and they'll have a portfolio of size five. So one of the reasons why we do this very simple uh, meta learning, which doesn't actually depend on the data set, is that this is very easy to ship in software. So we call this multiple defaults because that's really what it is. It is you, you provide a list of default values independent of the data set, but it's actually still going to be quite good. And so I can just pro, uh, like write down this list of hyperparameters of uh, XGBoost that I like, and it's going to be like three lines of Python, and I send you to this, uh, send this to you, and this is the outcome of the meta learning, and you can just use it. Um, so we did a bunch of experiments. Um, so here showing uh, the performance of um, solving the NP hard problem exactly from one to 60 faults. So over 60 faults is going to get too slow uh, versus uh, using the greedy um, approximation. And you can see that, that this is leave one data set out cross validation. Um, and what you should see is they're about the same thing. Overall, the greedy is even a tiny bit better, but it's probably all with, sort of within noise tolerance. Um, and as I said, doing the greedy optimization is nice because it allows us to give solutions for every number smaller than k at the same time. So in, in this paper that I mentioned, uh, we did this for um, several algorithms um, separately. We did it for ElastiCNet, Decision Tree, Gradient Boosting, Ada Boost, Random Forest, and SVM. And so we compared this against uh, random search and against uh, doing model-based optimization. So I think we did uh, SMAC here. So, um, so random search and MBO, in a sense, the comparison is a little bit unfair as neither of them does meta, meta learning. They only do search. Um, and so um, model-based Bayesian optimization does a lot of work during the, uh, like on the new data set, but you didn't do any work before. Random search didn't do any work um, previously to learn and doesn't do any work on each data set. So, but um, these are two like standard methods that makes sort of makes sense to compare to as a baseline. Our approach does um, basically this pretty big benchmark beforehand, but then, uh, when you want to uh, use it on a new data set, there's basically no computation as you just iterate over the list of your case settings. And so if you look at the number of evaluations, you can see that for a small number of evaluations, say one, 
up till like eight or 16, we're um, clearly dominating randomized search, which is um, maybe not that uh, surprising. So randomized search uh, usually and, um, doesn't focus in any way. So uh, it needs much more iterations to explore the space. Whereas we optimized for looking at the most critical places of the space. And so if we um, have four or eight uh, evaluations, then we actually already very close to the optimum. You can see that the uh, model-based Bayesian optimization is basically only ran on 30, uh, on um, 32 evaluations, because before that, uh, it doesn't really make sense because there's too few iterations to do anything, basically. You can't learn a Bayesian model on four observations. And so if you have this very constrained budget setting, or if you want results very, very quickly, um, then this strategy really pays off. And it's great because it's really, really simple. Um, we then extended this a little bit to um, using symbolic defaults, uh, which basically means we um, do something that's slightly dependent on the uh, data set. But basically, we have um, a default parameter, uh, a default hyperparameter setting that is dependent on very simple meta features. Um, so this means in this setting, we only would have a single hyperparameter setting, not a portfolio, but it would depend on um, meta features like the number of features. And so this is like very preliminary work. Um, but one of the things that we uh, found is we could rediscover what we knew was a good idea which is in a uh, kernel SVM to make the uh, kernel bandwidth gamma be a function of one over the number of features. And so it's kind of nice that we could um, empirically observe that this thing, which is actually the default value in scikit-learn, uh, actually you can discover this by running a benchmark. All right. so. This was the the idea of how to build these these portfolios, and um, now I try to integrate all of this into this um, new library called Dabble, which stands for Data Analysis Baseline Library. And obviously, it's named that because it allows you to dabble in data science um, very very quickly and iterate very quickly. And so, um, coming back to this loop, um, basically, I wrote a small piece that uh, helped you with each of them. Well, not so much data collection. I started with data cleaning. So there's a function called double.clean, which uh, basically takes in a data frame. So all of this is based on pandas. And um, it detects uh, types. It detects indi indices. It detects um, like duplicate values, outliers, um, and so on. It makes sure your encoding is correct. Um, so there's like some relatively basic cleaning, but something that uh, will allow you to put it into a model more easily. Then I have visualization for both regression and classification. So all of this is really uh, tuned towards um, supervised learning. And so double.plot will um, create basically um, um, a collection of visualization that are usually useful. It will automatically try to determine what kind of uh, visualizations are useful for continuous or categorical or ordinal features and how best to represent this information. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later. Uh, and then there's the uh, for the model building, I uh, have dabble.any classifier, which is um, similar in idea to what's an auto scalar, and only this one is based on this portfolio approach and um, is make it to run really, really quickly. There's also another one, which is a simple classifier, which allows you to get a, like a baseline result very, very quickly. And um, finally, there's uh, dabble.explain, which does uh, some basic model um, interpretation and evaluation. So it shows you some rock curves and does like some permutation feature importance, 
um, partially penance curves and so on. This is still um, a lot of work in progress, but um, you should be able to get out some inf interesting information about your model with just a single line of code. And then finally, obviously you have the um, deployment and integration. For this, you actually uh, have to think. Uh, I think this is one of the aspects of this project is really make you focus on the um, part that is the integration into your project, into your product, that is really um, your business need and um, how does all of this impact your product. And so make all the rest of the things simple, make them simple to iterate on so you can think about the things that are actually important, which is probably not the hyperparameters. All right, so let's go a little bit through um, each of these. I think I already said what double dot clean less. Uh, so it detects types, detects missing and rare values, um, detects ordinal versus categorical, um, near constant index. And so it throws out a couple of things and casts the rest. Um, then here's an example of doing plots. So this is basically a similar thing to uh, what I did earlier with Seaborn, only that does more with less code. Um, because it's really meant for the supervised uh, classification tasks. So the plot function just takes a data frame and then the target column. And then it shows things like the class distribution. It detects internally using clean um, what columns are uh, categorical and which are continuous. And then here it does um, a plot for the continuous columns, which you can see the top right. And then for the categorical columns, um, it does like um, yeah, it, it does the uh, mosaic plot, and um, it like tries to make it as a smartly so it like groups things together that have very high cardinality, and hopefully this gives you an idea over uh, most of the columns in this data set. And it sorts them by um, their, um, their relevance for the classification task. So relationship is the most important and race is the least important of the categorical columns in this data set. Um, what it also does is it automatically de uh, does scatter plot selection. So this here is um, one of the OpenML data sets, which I often use uh, for working with Dabble. Um, I think this is uh, robot uh, wall navigation. And so if it has, um, I think, like 20 continuous features, and if you want to plot 20 continuous features, that's sort of what it looks like. Um, I think this is really hard to comprehend. And so what Devil tries to do is it tries to find um, particular scatter plots where the interactions are meaningful and interesting. And so what it actually uses under the hood is it does cross-validation on very small um, decision trees on 2D uh, projections. So it looks at, uh, it selects some kind of 2D projections uh, based on the um, existing features, and then it runs a small decision tree. If the uh, decision tree can work well based on this um, projection, then it says this is an interesting projection. And so it ranks the, the uh, subsets of two features by how well does a small decision tree work on them. And you can see here the uh, top four ranked combinations. And so I found this is actually um, a quite a good proxy for uh, perception. So if a small decision tree can pick out where each class is, then I can also pick it out with my eyes. Um, so this is somewhat related to, um, uh, I think, uh, Skagnomics, it's called, uh, where basically you have metrics that evaluate how well uh, a plot does in some tasks. Here, I'm particularly interested in the task of supervised classification. So I um, have this metric that says, how good is this 2D scatter plot for showing um, multi-class classification result, um, like distributions? It also does a bunch of other things like setting the alpha and setting the scatter point size and tuning a bunch of other things. Um, 
Yeah. So apart from clean, there's also an easy preprocessor, which basically gets rid of a bunch of the boilerplate you would do in scikit-learn. So easy preprocessor is basically a column transformer out of two pipelines that do impute imputation and one hot encoding. So this is um, what I complained about earlier. If you do scikit-learn, uh, the boilerplate you have to write for any standard data set. Uh, this is just all in easy preprocessor. Um, so here I'm running this on the AIMS data set. And so it just automatically assembles the right, um, the right preprocessing. And then you can put this in a pipeline with whatever classifier you want, if you want to have more control. So this is actually not a fixed pipeline. It assembles a pipeline based on where there's missing values and so on. Then there's a simple classifier. So the simple classifier basically runs um, or is designed to run basically instantaneously and gives you very quick results. So it runs things that are very cheap to run because um, there's not really any any point in like deciding whether to run uh, naive base or not because naive base takes as long to run as um, scaling the data. So we just always run naive base and we always run a small decision tree and then we run some logistic regression and then we can compare these models and we'll always tell you uh, which is the best model so far. And so this is like on this adult data set, this is basically instantaneous and this allows you to iterate very quickly. Because at this point, if you look at the inter uh, if you do an explanation of this model, you'll probably find something that you missed in your pre-processing visualization, you're cleaning any data collection. So there's not really, um, you, you don't need to start tuning expensive models. You can just do something that's instantaneous and get some feedback very quickly. Um, once you did that, um, the any classifier then, um, implements this portfolio strategy. It actually does successive halving on the portfolio. So it um, combines this meta learning to, be, uh, to build a good set of kind of the type of parameters with um, successive halving, meaning um, it will uh, run the, the different hyperparameter settings on increasingly larger size uh, subsets of the data set. And so this will basically in total be as expensive as running a single model. It's like, it can be sometimes a little bit um, um, aggressive in, in throwing away some hyperparameter settings, but usually it gives you a pretty uh, solid response and it's much faster than running grid search. So even if we, we are, so we already beforehand restricted it to a portfolio of say like 20 different configurations or 20 different models, but uh, we don't even have to run 20 models on the full data set. We can use successive halfing to um, basically run this much more quickly. And so what it does uh, is it does this over linear models, random forest gradient boosting and kernel SVMs. Um, and we built a portfolio that basically optimized over all of these. Uh, maybe somewhat unsurprising, a lot of these are actually uh, gradient boosting models. So what we're using is the new hist gradient boosting in scikit-learn. This is basically a re-implementation of light GBM in scikit-learn. Um, so it should be uh, somewhat faster than XGBoost, about as fast as LightGBM. It's like way faster than the gradient boosting in uh, scikit-learn was before. If you haven't tried it out, if you like gradient boosting, try his gradient boosting in scikit-learn. So this is what uh, Dabble does, uses most of the time be uh, because gradient boosting just works incredibly well. Okay, I have some slides on successive halving, but I think I'm gonna skip them because writing down the formulas is really, really uh, not a good way to explain it. Uh, instead, maybe I'll uh, explain it with this figure. So the idea is that you have a standard set of, uh, of hyperparameters or models. So here for us, this is um, our portfolio, like our good, like five good defaults of uh, gradient boosting and two of um, like SVMs and random forest or something like this. And so here we start off with these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight configurations, and we run all of them on say 10% of the data. Then um, we, we evaluate them and we throw away the worst half. 
and we keep the better half, so we keep the best four. We run them on twice the amount of data, so on 20%. And um, then again, we throw away half of the, of the uh, configurations and we run it on twice of the data. Then we get, again uh, run it, throw away half the configurations and then we run this on the full data set. And so uh, basically, you run all the configuration on a small data set, you throw away iteratively the configurations that perform least well. And so this way you can um, evaluate many configurations, but much, much more quickly than um, you would do if you evaluate all of them fully. The downside of this is that um, maybe some of the configurations say in gradient boosting, you might have a low learning rate. And if the low learning rate um, might work well on the whole data set, but it might not work so well if you have only a small subset of the data set. So that's uh, why this might not sometimes not be entirely as good as uh, doing a full, full grid search, but it's much, much faster and usually it's good enough. Oh yeah, and so um, I think I already talked through all of this portfolio creation. Um, this is basically what the same that is done in the uh, this practical automatic machine learning for the automail challenge by the Freiburg group. They they um, already uh, sort of did that. Um, so one of the things that was very interesting for their setup, I thought, was that um, they ran this on a different benchmark data set, but they found out that on their benchmark data set, uh, they were using XGBoost and then basically all possible scikit-learn pipelines. If you just did used XGBoost, the results were as good as if you learn, if you search over basically all possible scikit-learn pipelines. Um, so that's that's quite interesting. So we did some more experiments. We found that actually you can improve a bit if you also add random forests and SVMs, but the improvements are pretty minimal. So if you just do XGBoost or just do like a gradient boosting algorithm, um, you, you can basically solve most of the problems that we have in our benchmarks. It might, that might not be reflective of problems in the real world, but it's the benchmarks that we have. Um, maybe it would be good to have better benchmarks, but so far it looks like basically gradient boosting um, wins nearly all of the time. And adding other algorithms to the gradient boosting portfolio only gives like minor improvements. Oh yeah, so finally, let me say a little bit about the ex what explain does. So for now, explain does, um, basically, if you put it in a random forest or gradient boosting model, it gives you two kinds of feature importances. The feature importances that are provided by the tree-based model in scikit-learn, so that's like random forest or feature importances. These are um, based on what's called MDE uh, minimum uh, decrease in impurity. These are sort of, uh, they can be a bit biased, but they're just computed during training. Um, What's probably more reliable is a permutation importance, which has been uh, in scikit-learn for like two versions or something like this. So this takes uh, some additional time, but it might give you a much more accurate uh, representation of which features are important. And then we're running partial dependence plots. For uh, a long while, there were only partial dependence plots for gradient boosting in scikit-learn. Now we have partial dependence plots for everything. All right, I think I'm actually at about time, which would be surprising. So um, I would love for you to give D Dabble a try. You can just do pip install Dabble. And then even if you just do dabble.plot on your data frame, hopefully it gives you some nice pictures. If it doesn't give you nice pictures, send me an email and I'll fix it. Um, this is definitely still a work in progress, but um, I'd love for you to try it. We don't have a portfolio for regression yet. So there's a simple regressor, but there is no, any regressor, so we don't have a portfolio search. Um, but you can still like give the pre-processing and plotting and everything a try for regression. All right, I think that's it. Also, I have this book, get this book. It's great, it's an introduction to machine learning with Python. Okay. Thank you very much, Andreas, for your talk. Um, let me read out the first uh, uh, entry in the, uh, in, in the chat channel. 
the tweets. Uh, thank you, Andreas. We really appreciate your wonderful work. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, I, a few short questions. Uh, the first one is easy to answer. Probably, could you share your presentation? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's already online. Um, I can send the link oh. around. Cool. It's a, there's um, like a, I have a GitHub repository, Talks ODT, and all my talks are in there. But I'll send a link around or tweet it or something. Cool, thanks. Um, what actually is in the uh, double clean function is one of the questions. Sorry, uh, can you repeat that? What, what is actually in the, in the double clean uh, function? What is done there? Well, it does uh, type detection mostly. So um, it detects, are there missing values? Should it be categorical or continuous or ordinal? So it does some tricks on the histogram for um, integers to see if it should be ordinal or not. It also, if you have, I think it's common is that you have strings in floating, point, uh, floating columns. So maybe there's an NA or missing or something like this. And it basically automatically detects that there are strings in the floating point columns, creates new categorical features for these strings, like basically a missing indicator. And then um, in a sense, you can say it detects how missing was encoded in the data. And then it does like, um, it throws away columns that are useless. Mm -hmm. um, OK, um, other question. Is AutoML good for beginners? It's a good question. Um, depends on what your goals are, I think. And so I think it's, if you do machine learning, I think it's a good idea to have some understanding. And people disagree about like how deep an understanding you should have to apply ML. Um, if you want to build a classifier quickly and just say, I want results, then um, I think doing AutoML uh, might be nice. Um, if you want to really understand what's going on, there's like basically arbitrary depth of um, like how, how deep you can go in trying to understand the model. And I think it's beneficial to have this background, but um, it might not in all cases be worth your time to like read up on all the math behind all the algorithms. It depends really on the situation, what your goals are. Mm -hmm. um, a very related question, and I think it's an important point, is, is the following one. Um, isn't there a real danger that users will understand the models even less uh, and are even more obvious to us uh, than, uh, than they already now uh, are now when uh, conducting a, a thorough analysis of the data upfront? What is your reaction to that? So I think my my intention, at least, is the opposite. And uh, the models that are created in Dabble, for example, are actually, I mean, they're relatively simple. Um, they're just gradient bo boosting models with some pre-processing. And I provide tools that allow you to understand them more easily. In scikit-learn right now, actually, if you do some pre-processing and you're on a model, it's kind of hard to understand how this relates to the original features. And I have some stuff in Dabble that basically fixes that. And so the idea is really to encourage people to look at the model. This is why I focus a lot on doing data visualization and doing model visualization. So um, mm. I want to make this easier so people actually do it. OK, thank you. Um... Abhishek is interested to learn uh, if uh, Dabble handles text data. Dabble does not handle text data as of now. Um, it should be very simple to add like um, some ngram stuff. Um, if you want to add like word vectors, then you need to make a. I haven't made it, uh, any word vector library a dependency, um, but that's also that's uh, worth considering. And uh, it's not entirely clear to me if you all, when you would want to use um, bag of words versus word vectors, um, or if you want to optimize over that. It's a little bit tricky. You probably need to run some benchmarks, but I don't know what data I would run these benchmarks on. Mm -hmm. uh, then another question by Abhishek is, uh, uh... A bit provo uh, uh, provocative, I guess. Uh, what are your views on enterprise AutoML uh, solutions? Uh, 
I think, again, it depends on the goal. And I think a lot of the enterprise auto ML is targeted towards the thing that uh, auto SQL learn is targeted to, towards, which is get the very best model independent of how much compute you have to expend, sort of. Like, you have a giant budget, and you, you're you okay to wait for a day, and you're going to uh, get the best model. But I don't think this is actually the most common problem. The most common problem is more about like understanding what's happening. There are so many like questions in these other parts of the boxes. So basically, if you only care about doing this like one part of the box, which is like the, I'm going to tune the model on this data set really, really, really hard, um, they're probably doing a good job at that. And Devil doesn't do a very good job at that. But I think this is not the problem that most data scientists face most of the time. Mm -hmm. A final question by uh, Avicek. What percentage of any auto ML solution is just heuristics? Um, so Devil is mostly heuristics except for the, the portfolio. Everything else is heuristics. Um, and I don't know, a, lo a lot of AutoML systems that I've seen are a lot of heuristics. And um, I'm not sure if it's a bad thing necessarily. Um, it's maybe, if you're an AutoML researcher, it's maybe a little bit disappointing to see that you can just always run gradient boosting and it's nearly as good as your fancy uh, Gaussian process. But uh, I mean, as, as a practitioner, I don't care so much that it is working. Mm -hmm. OK, with that, thank you very much again, Andy. Thank you again, uh, Philip, for your wonderful yeah, thanks talks. For having me. Uh, with that, I'll give back to Trent. If Trent is still there, oh, yeah, left to me. Then I'll we go immediately back to uh, uh, Abhishek. Are you still there, Abhishek? Hello? Uh, yeah, I, I, I pressed the wrong button. Um, yeah, thank you for, for the great talk and the great questions. Um, you know, I'll be doing, so, so thank you very much. And um, yeah, I guess we can uh, move to wrap this up. Uh, Thank you to both speakers, Philip and Andy, um, and uh, to everyone um, who has listened in and, and watched and for all your good, um, very good questions. Um, that's it for me. So yeah, anything else Adrian or Abhishek to add or Philip or Andy? Uh, 